I'm an extremely talented drone pilot, and this skill is going to come to the fore with today's episode. First we're going to do an aerial tour of Alan's outside, but unlike in episode 7, it's for me to point out the legacies of Alan's sordid past. Most of these legacies are in need of change, and are a result of the boat being made ready for a specific expedition that was funded and due to launch last year, before all the borders closed and it ended up cancelled. So here are the things I created at the time, somewhat under schedule pressure, which I now think can be improved or honed. Once I've pointed them out, and this by the way is a response to a few dozen comments and emails I've had from you, wise and discerning viewers, I'll then go into a little more detail about why Alan became Alan in the first place, and what he was destined for. A chilly destiny I'm determined he will fulfil again and again. The first obvious thing to point out is the pretty messed up gel coat. It was deoxidized and waxed by my teammate James last year, and would have sufficed for the expedition, but has now deteriorated. I've assessed that the gel coat hasn't begun to star or fracture, but it's time to protect the bleach surface, rather than another deoxidization and waxing. Let's not try and polish it. Alan! I've had a play with painting one of the hatches, as you can see, but I haven't used two-pack polyurethane paints before, and I screwed up both the amount of the thinner and the air temperature, so the finish was dire. I'll sand it back and go again later. I'm going to leave the gel coat below the rubber fender strip until the last minute before priming and anti-fouling. Next, around the sprinkler tubes which, having had my time again, I would have cleaned and polished instead of primed and painted, there are these weird little coloured pots with taped on bits of ducting foam. I know I'm teasing yet again about electrics, but I promise I will cover them. Them being cameras, but a quick explanation. I noticed the cases were bleaching in the sun, and to buy myself some time, built these cheap little caps. I tried bagging the cameras, but found that dew formed on the camera bodies and then couldn't drip off and escape. Then there's all this snaking plastic conduit tube. It's temporary and just to protect cabling from the sun until I can fully route the power and signal cables more neatly. You have spotted small discs on the front and back of the driving pod. These are stainless steel ports for ventilation pipes, inlet at the front and exhaust at the back. They were a perfect example of things I installed quickly and robustly last year, but that I want to improve before Alan has a paint job. This is how I did it. The ports are screw fit and can be opened and closed from both inside and outside. On the outside, I ended up with a fairly unimpressive quartet of bolt shanks sticking out of a bumpy black painted epoxy putty that I'd used for protection and bedding. So I've taken all this off with a grinding wheel, of course, back to the roughly flat surface. I've had a pair of discs laser cut from thin 316 grade stainless steel to the correct size, much cheaper than you'd expect, and I'm going to bed these onto the newly exposed putty surface using a standard solvent based adhesive filler, and then I can use sandable sealant to finish the circumference and prepare the whole thing for painting later on. I could have used mild steel since the disc is to be sandwiched between putty and paint, safe from air and moisture, but the price difference was only a pound. So we zoom past these mounted railings and towards Alan's bow. I've noticed that because of the way Alan is stored on his cradle, I'm usually filming and climbing aboard from the stern, so this view isn't something I see every day. Largely because I can't hover over an annoyingly fast-growing tree shrub thing that I think the boatyard owners wouldn't appreciate me sacrificing for the sake of seeing Alan's face more often. A couple of things at the bow. Firstly, the solar panel on the deck you can see from this angle is just a rollable 20 watt panel from my sledging journeys that I've taped down for the moment. It means I can trickle charge a couple of batteries. I want to install much larger and more efficient panels later on. Alan's raison d'etre last year would have involved very little sunlight. Hold on for the second half of this episode for more on that, but in future he'll see a lot more of it, so I'm going to install three types of power generation from sun, wind and fuel. Second, the bow hatch window. It's been designed as an angle that collects rainwater in a way that's not helpful. I'm going to do some head scratching about that one. A secondary glazing panel is an option and could help insulate too. The original plan for the top side part of the stern face, if that makes sense, was to add in strapping anchors that could secure a number of metal fuel containers. This was because we needed to transport about 80 litres of special super clean petrol, or gasoline, but let's call it petrol because that's what it is. It was needed to power expedition stoves for the ski and camping phase of Alan's cancelled expedition, and I didn't want that much petrol stored inside Alan, because I didn't want Alan to explode in a ball of flame. This is now a glorious blank canvas, but I suspect I'll still install mounting anchors of some kind, so different things can be stored here. 
Alan doesn't have a small tender and perhaps he'll need one, so we'll see. People in the comments have asked about extending the walkway on the stern. It's possible, but I'd need to have a really good justification, better than just to make a swimming platform. Alan is not for frolicking. This cinematic, dramatic sequence is just because I wanted to see how good the drone's obstacle avoidance was, as I felt it was being a bit overcautious before and wouldn't let me fly where I wanted. Getting bullied by a cocky drone isn't something I'm willing to tolerate. Otherwise, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see the before and after and obligatory time lapses as Alan's topside gets a full repaint from orange to a slightly different orange. I'm still awaiting the famously stable English spring weather for that one. Before I carry on, a quick thank you to all the people who have got in early and supported my channel directly on my website, avoiding YouTube ads, Patreon and so on. It's going to really help me grow and improve my videos and short films. The link to get involved is in the description. At this point I'm going to pivot and answer a question that's been asked nearly as much as how much did Alan cost? The question of what was Alan originally bought for? I'll tell you that now. I'm not going to tell you the exact purchase price for Alan, as it was a private transaction made by a business, so that's that. Alan was bought as a launch vehicle for something called the Dark Ice Project. Dedicated binge viewing watchers of my channel will have gleaned by now that my core work is developing and leading expeditions in very cold places, mostly the Arctic. This is the sort of thing I've got up to in the past, from a 113 day unsupported journey on the Greenland ice sheet, age 21, that still holds the record for the longest ever Arctic journey of its type, to spending a full winter season in the high Arctic driving teams of local sled dogs across hundreds of miles of ice. <laughs> the Dark Ice Project as a concept was born some years ago, and has seen a couple of reconnaissance expeditions, and then one serious but unsuccessful attempt from a Greenlandic start point. The overall aim is to travel from land to the North Pole, entirely in the winter season, so in the dark, and without resupplies from the outside world. I've more lately combined this aim with science survey work. The Greenlandic start point now seems unwise, and the launch of the Dark Eyes project last year, cancelled as I said due to border closures, was to be from the Canadian Alaskan northern coastline. The team I put together was three strong, all of whom had worked together for months in the Arctic in the past, and we managed to secure some pretty substantial large business funding partners, the sorts, as I said before, who would involve us in the development of new equipment and extreme clothing, not just as a skin-deep promotional deal. So Alan was to be sea freighted to the East Canadian coast from the UK, hauled by road across Canada to Toyotuyuktuk, and then launched from there. We'd skirt the coast and refuel in Ukiviak, Alaska, before heading around the Russian side of the Arctic Ocean ice pack and locking in for the winter. We scheduled two months minimum of science survey work based on Alan, before cocooning him in the pack and setting off for the two to three month ski phase to the North Pole. Arriving before the return of the sun, we'd intercept a Russian ice station and fly back to Europe. Alan would enter the transpolar drift so we could launch a salvage operation one or two seasons later in the North Atlantic, not a small or simple undertaking. Anyhow, I took the tough call to cancel and not postpone this particular iteration after the COVID cancellation. I bought Alan off the business and so now he's my problem and I'm determined to get him ready for even more elaborate journeys in cold waters. So, now you know, and hopefully that context now makes it all seem a bit more logical. I didn't want to lead the channel series with the origin story though, as we'd still be on 10 views I suspect, and not nearly 2 million. Thanks for getting to nearly the end, although I'm going to finish with the conundrum. I've been staring at this stern section quite a bit, it's become something of a hobby. The propeller nozzle mount sits lower than the already very shallow keel. If Alan grounded on soft mud, this would be unlikely to be an issue. However, if winched or otherwise lifted onto sea ice, damage is possible. As you have seen when I painted the bilge, the inside of this section is hollow, so it's susceptible to crushing forces from both sides. I wonder if there's an opportunity to add ballast, protect this important structure, and round the whole section into a more ice-friendly shape, all in one operation. I'll scratch my head for a little longer, and welcome many ideas from the comments, of course. Right, that's it. Thanks again to the good people heading straight to the link in the description for helping support my channel. Otherwise, of course, here's the obligatory book plug. You should all have at least one copy each by now, so if not, chop chop. Bye.